everybody knows where the influencer goes, history is sure to follow. And history will be the name of the game on Sunday, April 2nd in Los Angeles, California, when Second Wrestling puts on Mitzvah Mania, a show being billed as the first ever Jewish WrestleMania. And the matchup that I'm involved in that Sunday will shake the foundation of wrestling YouTube to its core. Why? Here's why. You might have heard of a guy named Simon Miller, a fellow YouTuber I'm very well acquainted with. Well, he and I are gonna be on opposing sides of the ring in an eight-man tag team matchup. I'm teaming with the Battle King, Dave Dutra, Ari Sampson, and Robert Baines, as Simon teams up with Zeb Saint, Gal Barquet, and Bodie Young Prospect. Now, Simon, everyone knows what a positive force you've been for the YouTube wrestling community over the years. God, you're so optimistic and you're so uplifting. You're a real mensch, as they say. And yes, Simon, you might be bigger than me and stronger than me and dare I say a little faster than me. But one thing you don't have over me, Simon, is my experience, my knowledge, my leadership skills. Make that three things you don't have over me. Do you have what it takes, Simon? Do you have the gall, the jam to lead your team against my squad of Maccabee Warriors? <laughs> I don't think so. Guess what? It's a long time coming. I didn't think it was going to happen, but these bad boys are going back on WrestleMania weekend. I'm putting the boots back on, and I'm going to show you and everyone in Los Angeles why the influencer is the real bona fide YouTube celebrity. Simon, you might as well be giving me and my team an early golden up because we are going to stomp all over your team at Mitzvah Mania, and I will show you and everybody why I do it for the content. Every year, WrestleMania provides a great snapshot of the pro wrestling landscape. Who's the here and the now? Whose stock is rising and whose is trending downward? If you watch enough manias through the years, you sometimes catch a fascinating glimpse at individual wrestlers' career arcs. From leaping to the top to tumbling down the near obscurity, it's fun to watch the writing on the wall change as the years go by. Obviously, being on a WrestleMania is an incredible honor no matter where a wrestler ends up on the lineup. Getting on consecutive shows, that's top tier stuff. But some of these moves up and down the card are enough to give you a whiplash. This week, I'm gonna rank them. My picks for WrestleMania's top eight most dramatic rises and falls. And just so there's no confusion, I'm only going with back-to-back -back WrestleManias here, nothing out of sequence. Let's begin. Number eight, Matt Hardy, WrestleMania 33 to WrestleMania 34. Matt Hardy is no stranger to being on WrestleMania. He and his brother Jeff made their Mania debuts 23 years ago, but this particular entry focuses on his later appearances. Between Matt's WWE release in 2010 and his comeback in 2017, he went on a journey through a variety of gimmicks, including Big Money Matt and, of course, Broken Matt Hardy. The wild character made Matt the talk of the business, so it shouldn't have come as a shock that WWE wanted to get a piece of the action. The Hardy Boys' return at WrestleMania 33 was easily one of the better orchestrated and best received surprises the company has done in the last decade. Matt and Jeff appeared as a mystery fourth team in a ladder match of the Raw Tag Titles, having just finished working the WrestleCon Super Show and Supercard of Honor that same weekend. In their signature match, the brothers regained the tag titles 17 years after their first such win in WWE. It was as storybook as it got. The pair dropped the tag titles to Cesaro and Sheamus just two months later as the novelty had worn off and the Hardys became just another tag team. Jeff would go down with an injury and left Matt a bit stranded until Impact Wrestling finally gave up the rights to the broken gimmick. This led to Matt becoming woken and feuding with Bray Wyatt. WWE's version of the final deletion ended with Bray falling into the lake of reincarnation, but these two weirdos would soon cross paths once again. At the kickoff for WrestleMania 34 in New Orleans, Woken Matt became the fifth man to win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal with some help from the Eater of Worlds, leading to a partnership that paid off with a brief, meaningless tag title run. Though it was another accomplishment on Matt's impressive resume, by that point any significance or relevance the armbar might have had was, one might say, deleted. Though it was a fun moment, you only have to take a few steps back and look at the bigger picture and see just how the company squandered the potential in the Hardys' return. Matt's journey from Mania 33 to 34 was almost booking in reverse, an ultimate triumph to starting at square one with the formation of a new team. Number 7. Demolition, WrestleMania 6 to WrestleMania 7. 
Before the New Day and the Usos both surpassed their record for longest tag title reign in company history, the team of Demolition were considered one of the standard bearers of tag team wrestling. Not bad for a team created almost solely to siphon some of the Road Warriors' cool factor. Though you could argue that Animal and Hawk were the more badass tandem, Demolition had the benefit of being booked better, and they were allowed to be the conquering babyface champions that LOD never were. Axe and Smash went on a good run of Manias, debuting at WrestleMania 4 to win the tag belts from Strike Force. Their momentum carried over to the next year, when the pair beat Mr. Fuji and the Powers of Pain in a handicap match. They dropped and reclaimed the tag titles from the Brain Busters before feuding with the ultimate team you wouldn't want to mess with in real life, Andre the Giant and Haku. Poor Andre was on his last legs as a competitor, and his tag title reign was more of a gold watch, the perfect setup for the Axe and the Smasher to win their then-record third tag titles at Mania 6. But then a funny thing happened. The actual Road Warriors showed up, and suddenly Vincent Mann felt like Patrick Bateman comparing business cards in American Psycho. Things got worse the demo's fortunes when Crush was added to the group after Axe began suffering health issues. Seeing the writing on the wall, Bill Eady left after the 1990 Survivor Series to start a series of demo litigious teams on the indies for several years. At this point, Demolition's plunge down the ranks became clear, but were still good enough to be placed on the granddaddy of them all. At WrestleMania 7, Smash and Crush were dug out from the bottom of the toy chest to be used as sacrificial lambs to Tenru and Kitao in that show's popcorn match. You knew the jig was up when they traded in the badass Rick Derringer theme for this generic spooky mess. Number 6, The Miz, WrestleMania 27 to WrestleMania 28. Now here's one that ought to make CM Punk both angry and filled with righteous glee. If you were to make a list of the least likely WrestleMania main eventers, The Miz would be near, if not at the top of the list. During his entry and rise up to the business, Miz ate plenty of proverbial plates of shit as he slowly gained respect in the locker room and won just about every title there was to win, peaking with the WWE Championship in late 2010. I know I just ranked the main event of WrestleMania 27 as one of the worst in the show's 38 year history, but hey, he beat John Cena in the main event to retain the WWE title. You can't do much better than that. Which is why the A-lister's involvement at next year's Mania was such a tragic fall. For playing his part in helping to build the Cena Rock feud for WrestleMania 28, The Miz's reward came in the form of a battle for boss supremacy. Because the Andre Battle Royal hadn't been created yet, that year's way to get as many folks on the card as possible was a 10-man tag match pitting Team Teddy Long versus Team John Laurinaitis. The Miz had to earn Johnny Ace's favor in order to get on the team in the first place. Not like that! And even though he wasn't the focus of the match, he did get to pin local idiot Zack Ryder, who got betrayed by Eve Torres for the umpteenth time. At least while succeeding downward, Miz managed to consistently play a foil for a larger angle two years in a row. Can we add that to his Grand Slam credentials? Number 5. Bam Bam Bigelow, WrestleMania 10 to WrestleMania 11. I know we've been mired in the negatives of this list for a while, but hey, how about a couple of positive examples? Despite returning to the Federation in 1992 after some time away, Bam Bam Bigelow didn't get a spot on WrestleMania until two years later at Mania 10 in Madison Square Garden, where he and his main squeeze Luna Bashan wrestled Doink and his sidekick Dink in the second match of the show. Hijinks were had and the baddies won the day in a bout that was the spiritual successor to another infamous Mania match, more on that a bit later. The wrestling business was, to put it kindly, in the mud by 1995, and the WWF needed a home run to get people to watch Wrestle Mania 11, or rather, a touchdown. The Federation managed to snag recently retired NFL star Lawrence Taylor for a high-profile main event match of the Showcase of the Immortals. Despite waiting in the mid-card for much of 1994, Bigelow was given the nod to be LT's opponent because of his skill in the ring, and as Bruce Pritchard once put it, he looked the part. To their credit, Bigelow and Taylor absolutely over-delivered, giving fans arguably the best celebrity match until Mayweather and Big Show 13 years later. It's easy to poke fun at the absurdity of Bigelow having to lay down for a celebrity guest, and it does show the desperation the WWF was feeling in their time of financial crisis. But a Mania main event is a Mania main event, and you can't argue those year-to-year -year gains. Bigelow wouldn't be around by WrestleMania 12. He was granted his release by the end of the year after being beaten down by the monster known as Backstage Politics. Which brings me to my next entry. Number 4, Diesel, WrestleMania 10 to WrestleMania 11. 
You can't talk about this week's topic without mentioning Kevin Nash, he of Silver Tongue and Shaky Quads. After going through a series of goofy gimmicks in WCW, from loosely mob-affiliated Vegas Gambler to actual wizard, Nash truly made his name as Diesel, the bodyguard for Shawn Michaels in the WWF. Big Daddy Cool's official coming out party may have been at the 1994 Royal Rumble, when he eliminated seven men and was cheered on his way out of the arena. Yet his WrestleMania debut two months later was practically a walk-on role accompanying HBK to ringside and being ejected after attacking Razor Ramon during their ladder match. It's safe to say that things got a little bit better for him afterward. In the next seven months after Mania, Diesel racked up the Intercontinental, Tag, and WWF titles, making him the first to win all three in the same calendar year. His world title reign in particular would be historic in its own right as he held it for nearly a full year, peaking at WrestleMania 11 when he beat Shawn Michaels in one of the best matches of his career. Even though Diesel might not have been in the main event of that show, see our previous entry, to go from bodyguard to conquering babyface champion in a single year might be the best miles per gallon average spread in wrestling history. Number 3. Stone Cold Steve Austin, WrestleMania 17 to WrestleMania 18. Okay, back to the falls. It can be argued that 2001 was Steve Austin's greatest year on top. Back from neck surgery, the Texas Rattlesnake won his third Royal Rumble match in January and main evented WrestleMania 17 alongside The Rock. To be in the main event of what's widely considered the best WrestleMania of all time, with one of the most shocking conclusions of all time, is a pretty amazing height to hit. And even though Austin's subsequent heel turn has been agonized over by fans and critics ever since, he still put out great work with guys like Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle, and became one of the most captivating characters characters of the year as the paranoid leader of the Alliance. But when that storyline wrapped up, in came the NWO. A mania match between Austin and Hogan was talked about, but never happened for a variety of reasons. And so, with The Rock wrestling the Hulkster instead, and Triple H fighting Chris Jericho for the undisputed title, that left Austin with the next best option available. After a few weeks of some hasty, half-hearted heat, WrestleMania 18 featured Stone Cold going against the New World Order's Scott Hall. To give you an idea of how much thought was put into this match, Kevin Nash was not given a match of his own and was booked to be Hall's corner man because, according to legend, they wanted a backup plan ready to go should the bad guy fall off the wagon before Mania. The match was nothing special, save for Hall's legendary sell for the stunner, and Stone Cold came out on top. Not saying a match with Austin and Hulk Hogan would have been particularly good, but had all parties agreed to it, it might have been a better path for Austin than being in a middling mid-card match with the NWO's least reliable member. It was one of the many, many signs that Austin's days in the company were numbered. Number 2. King Kong Bundy, WrestleMania 2 to WrestleMania 3. Hulk Hogan's career as a babyface is partially defined by all the giants and monster heels that he vanquished. And during that mammoth four-year reign with the WWF title in the 80s, King Kong Bundy was one of the first. After the Hogan-Piper feud ran its course, Bundy was picked to be Hogan's opponent in the main event of WrestleMania 2 as somewhat of a palate cleanser. Though he was the centerpiece of the Bobby Heenan family at the time, anyone who knew the score figured that Bundy didn't stand a chance against the immortal one in Los Angeles. The match saw the debut of the glorious Big Blue blue cage and ended when Bundy and the Brain each got theirs. Bundy was still treated like a big deal, so to speak, working alongside Big John Studd as a tag team. But plans for the two to win the tag belts were sunk when Studd left the company, leaving Bundy high and dry. And when you're left high, there's nowhere to go but low. Lower? Lower still. Left wandering without a program, Bundy was slotted in the comedy spot on WrestleMania 3, teaming with Little Tokyo and Lord Littlebrook to face the trio of Hillbilly Jim, Little Beaver, and the Haiti Kid. After several minutes of silliness, Bundy spoiled the party by squishing poor Little Beaver and getting DQ'd. The match was just the beginning of Bundy's descent from Heenan Family Heavy to just another wrestler. Bundy would leave the WWF in late 87 to pursue a career in acting. And my pick for the most dramatic rise or fall between WrestleManias in history is Randy Savage, WrestleMania 8 to WrestleMania 9. If you think about it, it's the macho man who could be considered the first Mr. WrestleMania. He and Ricky Steamboat stole the show at WrestleMania 3, he wrestled four times in one night at Mania 4, and he dropped the belt to Hulk Hogan in an all-time classic at Mania 5. Then the 90s happened. 
Things took a hard left at the turn of the decade as Mach would feel the madness of a mixed tag team match, then a retirement match against the Ultimate Warrior. But Savage wouldn't stay retired for long as he was hurtling toward a WrestleMania 8 match with Jacob the Snake of Roberts before fate intervened and the card got shuffled a bit. Instead, Savage pivoted to a program with Ric Flair over the WWF title, with some scandalous pictures of Flair and Miss Elizabeth adding fuel to the fire. Though it could have been worse given what we know about the Nature Boy. It was a terrific match that saw Savage close out the first half of the show with his belt and his lady. It seemed weird for the match to go on so early at WrestleMania, but at least this way Savage could have his moment without Hulk Hogan in the way of the spotlight. So how do you reward a guy who came through in a pinch, put on an excellent main event quality match for the championship, and help carry the company through the summer? You put him at the announce desk. Yes, at the ripe old age of 40, Vince felt that Savage was a bit long in the tooth and moved him back to the announce desk for WrestleMania 9, anchoring the show with Bobby Heenan and a debuting Jim Ross. Considering how bereft of star power that year's WrestleMania was, having Savage actually wrestle on this show should have been a no-brainer. Mr. Man would still occasionally wrestle if the plot required it, like in his feud with Crush that culminated at WrestleMania 10, but mostly stayed behind the desk until he jumped ship to WCW in late 94. From becoming the belle of the ball one year to being on commentary the next, it's why I think Randy Savage had the most dramatic fall between WrestleManias. Actually, the more I think about it, the real number one is Seth Rollins, from WrestleMania 30 to WrestleMania 31. Even in the beginning of his career in WWE, it seemed obvious that Seth Rollins was destined for great things. His main roster debut as one-third of the Shield should have made that abundantly clear. The Hounds of Justice had a short but effective showing at WrestleMania 30 when they squashed some of the biggest representatives of the Attitude Era not named Steve Austin or The Rock in a six-man tag team match. Then, of course, things got real interesting for Rollins, Reigns, and Ambrose for the next 365 days or so. Fast forward to Mania 31 at Levi's Stadium. Rollins, now the crown jewel of the authority, had not one but two legendary moments at that year's show. Not only was he the recipient of one of the most badass RKO's in history, he became the first and so far only person to successfully cash in money in the bank in the main event of the Showcase of the Immortals. From year to year, that has to make Seth's rise the biggest of its kind between manias. How's that for a surprise ending? What other rises or falls do you think belong here? I'm sure you got a few of them. Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Click that bell icon to get all the notifications. Hope you're enjoying this WrestleMania themed month, folks. Next week, I come back with my review of WrestleMania 14. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.